Welcome back, everyone, to Random's Thoughts. We're jumping into another Rune Strike deck breakdown. This time, as you can see above me, we got Big Red on deck. What is Big Red? Well, let's talk about it because this is a deck that got me from the bottom ranks all the way up to Diamond in, honestly, not that many games, and I've been enjoying playing it both on and off stream. So let's break it down. As always, we're going to jump into this, go card by card, and then we'll talk about the deck as a whole. Obviously, there'll be some additional thoughts as we go through it, kind of smattered throughout. But before we even get to either of those, let's talk about the champion herself. Now, Brienne here is a Light and Chaos champion, which is a faction combination that doesn't seem to be very popular if you go by my Twitch chat. It when I initially selected this champion and started playing her on stream, people were, I don't want to say taken aback, but they were a little surprised that I was electing to go with this particular champion. And going into it, because I didn't have a whole lot of experience with her, I wasn't really sure what to expect other than what Chad had told me, which was, for the most part, it, they felt it, it was very clunky, it didn't quite mesh well with the different realms, but... It seemed to have worked out. Now, I do have some comments about both the build and the combination that we'll get to in time. But first, let's talk about the powers. The first one up is Battle Axe Slash, which, full disclosure, as I've mentioned in previous videos, as you can see, I don't have the third ability unlocked. And to be honest, I didn't unlock the second one until I was two, three games away from hitting Diamond. And then all of a sudden, it pops, and okay, now we have more options. It didn't matter in some of those other games. It probably would have mattered in previous games. But let's jump back to Battle Slash. So this is a deal 3 damage to target enemy, and 1 damage to any adjacent minions. 3 blood for a surprisingly powerful ability, and we're going to come back to this as I talk about the cards, but... The entire concept here, and I know I said we'll get to this later, but the entire concept is that you're constantly pressuring. This seems to be a consistent theme with the builds that I've been posting as of late. I never considered myself really an aggro player or somebody that even leaned into aggro over other archetypes, control, mid-range, aggro, control, combo, whatever. I just kind of played whatever. But lately, I've been leaning more into more of the aggressive end of the spectrum. Now, this deck is not aggro, but it does have some aggressive tendencies, and I would probably classify it as aggro control slash midrange. Battle Axe Slash allows you to serve multiple purposes in that vein because it can be removal, it could be face damage because notably it says target enemy, it could even be a board clear, and I had a number of games where my opponents either were forced into playing, say, a Sickle Stalker in an awkward lane, meaning that I get a two-for-one because they had to, or sometimes people just make mistakes and you're able to capitalize on it because of Battle Axe Slash. Next up is Scorch Shield. Until, until your next turn gain counter, deal damage equal to your attack. Now, as with previous builds, we don't have any attack buffing cards in this particular list. You could obviously go and reach for some I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. Scorch Shield serves multiple purposes. It can A, be a potential board clear. If you're playing against aggro or your opponent somehow has the upper hand, yes, you'll eat a bunch of damage, but you can wipe out a number of their minions. Additionally, it pushes face damage, and that did come up in some games. It's just one more than Battle Axe Slash. I imagine you're not often going to be activating this, but it can be very relevant. Now, the third ability, which again, we don't have unlocked, is Hero of the Highlands. Conjure a warrior, give it plus two, plus two in Blitz. If you're new here, I talk about Blitz a lot. I love Blitz as a keyword. It is super powerful, and I love playing cards that are powerful. I didn't often hit the five blood threshold, but in the matchups where I did, I could certainly see expending it in favor of Hero of the Highlands versus two battle axe slashes because it's generating a body giving even say a viking raider that you happen to pull off this because they are warriors plus two plus two and the blitz is redundant it's still now a four four with blitz that's still pretty relevant whether it's uses removal or it's uses face damage or just a general clock even if it's still quote unquote early in the game as early as five blood will allow I think this has a lot of potential, but it clearly isn't necessary to get the diamond if that's your goal. So let's talk about the actual cards. This is where things get a little weird. 
The reason I say that is while I was able to make it to champion, the deck went through a number of iterations, some minor changes. We we basically have the core of the original build, and maybe it goes beyond the core. Probably like 80% of the deck is still the same as it was when I first built it. A number of cards that were changed in or out were kind of always on the list of, I just want to try this thing. And then as I climbed the ranks, it turned out, yeah, this thing isn't quite cutting it. It's a little awkward. It's a little clunky. It's a little weird, whatever the case may be. But let's jump in card by card and break it down. So the first one up is Acid Spray. Target minion gains suffer two for one mana. This is, I would love to cut this card, but there's a number of scenarios where it came up, even recent ones that ultimately the games resulted in a loss. Specifically, I'm talking about the Agma combo deck. Why did Acid Spray matter there? Well, you can. This is one of the few cards that allows you to target your own minions, which, as an aside, is something that maybe should be looked at as a way to combat that deck. If there were more cards that allowed you to target your own stuff, your opponent can't set up that Wombo quite as easily. Now, despite finding multiple Acid Sprays, we still fell to the deck. They were able to just plop the Soul Slasher out. We couldn't remove it quickly enough, and Womp womp, we got the loss. But we wouldn't have even been in it if we weren't able to acid spray our own minion to try and get things set up. Not exactly the recommended way to play it, but obviously it allows you to get through armor. It can function as early removal because the curve on this deck is very clogged at certain slots and the one drop slot is not it. It's not impossible or uncommon for you to have one extra mana laying around. And when we get to the next card, sometimes playing out a card suboptimally is still going to be beneficial. So Acid Spray has some uses. I'd love to cut it. There's probably better options. My collection is just limited. Next up is Crazed Alchemist. The Alchemist is spectacular. This is one of those cards that I can't sing its praises enough. It's a two-drop that actually comes out on two and is relevant because it basically says take two damage, draw two cards. Or you could play it later in the game and then refill your entire hand if you've been sitting on blood. You just have to be careful of your sequencing to make sure that you are using or not using, respectively, your blood ability so that you get the best usage. Sometimes you don't want to take seven damage. You're not going to draw seven cards. You already have a bunch in hand. But you do want to draw some. So make sure you're expending the blood ahead of time or, again, banking it so that that way you can alchemist and get the most value. There were a lot of games where I sat there and my opponent probably thought that I was just sandbagging them, but I was really just counting and trying to make sure that I had the play sequence right to optimize how many cards you're drawing off of this. But Craze Alchemist is, to me, bonkers. I, given the change, I have a hard time saying that this is not an auto-include in any Chaos deck. Maybe there are some that don't want it, but I feel like you want it in everything. Next up is Mastodon. If you've been here before, like I said earlier, Blitz. There you go. The difference here is that, as always, it's flexible. And maybe that phrase doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The difference here is that, as always, that doesn't work at all. What am I saying? It's the same sort of thing that you can push damage, you can use removal. It's also an earlier drop, which, again, because we're clogged at 4, we're clogged at 7, especially as we get up the curve, we start having difficulty playing multiple cards a turn. And it can be very important for you to be able to play the Mastodons early, either to ensure that your crazed alchemists are getting optimal value or just a pressure. And that's one thing that we'll talk about later, but you need to keep a clock on before bad things happen to you. Viking Raider, again, Blitz. I don't care about the Frenzy. We'll leave it at that. Now, Righteous Wrath is something that I do want to talk about a little more extensively. We are a little clogged at four because we have both these as well as Sickle Stalkers. And the reason that I say that it's clogged as opposed to three, where we also have four cards, is four is just kind of an awkward turn where you want to start turning the corner and make sure that you're you're catapulting yourself into the latter stages of the game in a good position because this deck plays pretty effectively downhill. And we'll touch on that again later. Key thing that I want to point out with Righteous Wrath is that it can go face, which I didn't realize until I was streaming this deck previously. Being able to go face is huge because while four damage may not sound spectacular, Four damage is still four damage, and ending the game now versus having to wait a turn, giving your opponent time because they survived at four, clearly makes a difference. Later in the game, you could go Righteous Wrath, Righteous Wrath, Face Punch, have 12 
out of nowhere. That's a pretty decent chunk of damage. Maybe not out of nowhere, given that you see the hero attack or the champion attack, but still, you get the idea. Sickle Stalker, again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Blitz. Blitz is amazing. Blitz, uh, if I had more reasonable Blitz cards to include in here, I would. Full stop. Next up, Mindless Raider. I wonder what I'm going to say. I think you're tired of the broken record, but it's a little clunkier. It's a more sizable body. Unfortunately, five can both be good and bad because there are a number of things such as Nightmare that hit at five, but there are a number of things that hit at four, such as Desert Twister. So you just have to be cognizant of which Blitz minions you're playing where, which ones you want to run into a body versus ones you want to go face and when. And especially, as I mentioned earlier, given the clunkiness of this latter half of the deck, you need to make sure that you're mapping out your Blitz plays and other plays so that you are playing them and allowing yourself to play multiple cards later in the game, especially when you get to things like Longship Raid. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Next up is Bright Song. Bright Song is part of the Sweeper complement. Now, does it matter that it's dealing damage versus just killing things? Does it matter that it does any particular thing? Not really. It's just I want to clear their board. Obviously, Bright Song sometimes needs a little nudging, aka you need your champion ability or you need some blitz effects or whatever to try and make that happen. This is where pairing up the plays, especially later in the game, can matter because you might have to Bright Song and then Mastodon or Viking Raider respectively in order to try and get there. Sometimes you're going to have to make awkward plays and hope your opponent doesn't have something because you might need to, on turn six, set up a Righteous Wrath into a Bright Song or vice versa, just to hope that you get there. Sometimes your opponent will have a way to heal it, thinking those Emrys builds or something like that, or they'll have a buff of some kind. But Bright Song generally is a board clear and is certainly very relevant immediately following things like March of the Dead or other board filling cards. Next up is a free. This was a late inclusion. There were a few cuts, notably Sun Chariot, notably Apothesis, that were in there early on, mostly as meme cards. I just wanted to try them out. They seemed fine. They were okay most of the time. There was this floating slot, and there's another card that we'll talk about later that became Ifrit. Ultimately, you could include those cards. I definitely won some games on the back of Apothesis. There were plenty of games where it sat in my hand and it was dead. Ifrit allows you some flexibility. While you don't control the curses that you're presented, pretty much all of them are always going to be somewhat relevant. And, of course, given the theme of this deck, you have the opportunity to just play. I'm going to play a 6-5 that does 5 to you when it comes out. Sometimes just the face damage matters. So next up is Longship Raid. I told you we'd come back to it. This is where, and as you've seen, we've already seen three 7-cost cards. We're now on the next two. We're talking about a lot here, and your hand can get very, very... It's just going to be stuffed, I guess is the best way to put it. You'll have these high-cost cards. You just can't quite do anything but play one a turn, which means the Longship Raid is putting some of these Viking Raiders on top of your deck. It gets very awkward, and that's where the early stages of the game matter. Mapping out your turns that even though you may be playing into card disadvantage if you walk into a sweeper or something, you kind of need to dump things out of your hand so that you can prep for the Longship Raids, either as board clears, as face damage, as a combination thereof, whatever it is, because you don't really want to be drawing those Raiders if you can help it. Look, sometimes you just have to, but you want to avoid it if you have the opportunity. Next up is Meteor Storm, another in the Sweeper complement. I really like this card. Unfortunately, because it costs 8, it makes it very clunky. As you can tell, we have Acid Spray, we have Alchemist, and then I guess if you sat on some, some Vikings. Those are the only cards you're playing on the same turn that you Meteor Storm. Again... Your hand will get stuffed with these high-end cards. You can't quite always play them out. And I think that's one of the problems with the deck is the curve needs to be smoothed out a little bit. And I think that there are ways that I'll go into momentarily that it can be improved. But Meteor Storm is super powerful. I don't imagine any iteration of the deck is going to cut this. Next up is a, another late addition similar to a Freed. It just took one of those floating slots, and that's Tartarus. I became... 
we'll say intimately familiar with Tartarus during my Fearless Pauper run with Crow. You can definitely check that out in my Rune Strike playlist here on YouTube. But Tartarus kind of plays into the idea that we're pushing face damage with both Warcry and the Berry, although we're eating some of it, admittedly. It's also a board clear. Problem is it'll often clear our board. This was added, I think, three games before I hit maybe four games before I hit Diamond. Point being is that it's certainly not required. You could replace it. I'm not even sure it belongs in here because, again, you're going to nuke the majority of your own minions. So take that with a grain of salt. Next up is Angel of Hope. Now, this card, again, broken record time, is super clunky. We don't have really a lot of things that we can play on the turn we play it. It might as well cost 10 other than you can play it a turn sooner. But the life gain is super important. And because of the big butt and resurrect and the evasion, it earned its keep. You're able to block their threat. Odds are you're going to resurrect into keeping your threat, therefore pushing damage, plus you're gaining eight health, which can break the race in your favor. Angel of Hope is pretty solid. I could consider including another, but again, you got to rework the curve. You got to look at a few different things because you just sometimes end up with a handful of, I'm going to play one card a turn and you're still at like 70 health. That's a problem. Now, last card in the deck is Rod. This is something that literally costs 10, but is pretty important. Fits in with the whole theme of pushing face damage or having cards that are able to push face damage outside of combat. There's a lot of burn in this list, which is where the name Big Red comes from. A call back, a call out to other games. But Rob was actually pretty important through a number of games. Able to steal wins, I'll say. It, it wasn't, oh, you're a 10, I top deck Rob. It's just... We were going to be at 10 resources for a few turns. As long as I can set up a turn where I can bang 10 you out of nowhere, I'll be able to break the race again in our favor, similar to Angel of Hope. I think Ra is going to be in most future iterations of this build, but given the 10 cost, he has to be looked at as something that could be cut. So now that we talked about all the cards, let's talk about the deck as a cohesive whole. We broke down all the cards, but what are we doing here other than, well, let's just play Blitz things and go face. Well, okay, yes, you do that. Don't get me wrong. You do want to push damage. Against some things, you are the control deck. Against some things, you are the aggro deck. You want to get, and that may be malleable, you want to get into that aggro deck driver's seat as quickly as possible where you are playing downhill and putting pressure on your opponent. You probably heard this multiple times in my other deck breakdowns. The difference here is that you have all of these sweepers similar to the crow list that we talked about last time that allow you to continually clear blockers. You have champion abilities that also allow you to clear blockers as well as go face. So at a certain point, once you have broken your opponent to a certain level, you just start aiming for the face. You should have been doing that at the beginning of the game. Again, it's not uncommon to play Mastodons or to play Viking Raiders or even Sickle Stalkers just in an open lane and get there because if your opponent doesn't address it quickly, and by quickly I mean basically immediately, it's going to push enough damage that you can get there in the late game and then suddenly turn your removal cards like Righteous Wrath into burn. They go face just as easily as they get pointed at opposing minions. Additionally, things such as Tartarus and Ra, Longship Raid, the Ifrit, a variety of these cards will all of a sudden provide explosive damage. Now, calling back to what I said earlier about the namesake for this deck, Big Red, the idea is that you are a control deck, mid-range, sort of. I'm, I prefer... It's not quite aggro control where it's present a threat and then protect it at all costs, but you can certainly play that game plan with this deck. You plop a Sickle Stalker on the board, okay? I'm just going to clear everything that ever sits in front of it or any other minion. Granted, that doesn't quite happen in Rune Strike because of the way the combat works, but that game plan can happen if your opponent decides that they're going to fill the board with X and then, okay, well, I just need to get to my turn and I'll have some breathing room. Funny story about that. I'm going to Meteor Strike. I'm going to 
A1, I'm going to Bright Song, I'm going to Righteous Wrath, I'm going to do a bunch of mean things and make sure that you never have blockers. But the entire time, you're pushing damage, pushing damage, pushing damage. Now, as mentioned when I was breaking down the cards, there's a lot of very clunky sequences with this deck, which is part of the reason that you need to lean into, maybe not empty your hand, but play a lot of cards early on and then refill later with Craze Alchemist or rely on your high-end cards in order to bail you out and close the game out at the end of the game. Ideally, you would smooth this out. Iron Bowl should be in here. That would be an easy upgrade on probably one of the Mindless Raiders. Yes, it's a little bit smaller, but it's now a 5-play, a 5-drop play, which, as you can see, we don't have. Ideally, you'd want to find something other than Ifrit and Tartarus, Again, Tartarus was a late edition. I don't have a lot of play with it. I could see where this is valuable, but simultaneously I could see this sitting in our hand and almost never getting played. Because, again, it's going to end up destroying our own board. And before combat, if it, it, it like did it as a rally or something, maybe... I don't know. I'm, I'm not super enthusiastic about it, but it allowed me to push face damage, or at least have the potential to push face damage, and it was key in one of the games that's going to be tacked on to the end of this video. Other changes that could be made, as I said, Blitz upgrades. If there are more cards that get introduced that are along the lines of Righteous Wrath, where you have the flexibility to potentially go face with them, that's where you want to look for these things. Overall, I think the core of the deck is definitely viable and i'm looking for upgrades for this from future card releases i guess the big question is can you hang with the big boys i think you can it's definitely going to be a challenge it's definitely going to be a matter of you cutting the game shorter than they want it to be so i alluded to the ogma combo deck earlier if they get the pieces in time i'm not sure there's much you can do unless you're able to rush them down and basically that same Assertion is going to apply to a variety of the better control decks, the better tier one decks that you just need to put enough pressure on them to ensure that you get to the end of the game. Because often you're going to look at the end of the game and realize, oh yeah, I lost to that enormous thing and I have no removal to deal with it. Well, the answer was, could you have ended the game before that enormous thing either came online at all or before it got in multiple hits? Because often that was the case where I was one or two turns away from winning and maybe if I had turned the corner and tried to go face sooner, we would have been better off. Now, ultimately, does that lead you to say, well, why aren't you just playing an aggro deck? Yes, I can certainly understand that argument. But at the same time, it's nice to be able to utilize some of these champions as I started the beginning of the video out with where maybe people aren't excited to play this particular combination of realms maybe they're not excited about playing this particular champion specifically immaterial or irregardless of the realms themselves it gives you some additional options so if you were drawn to playing burn if you were drawn to hey you know what i feel like ending the game right now then i think this might be a deck you want to try so let's take a look at some of the games but as always everybody thank you for listening Thank you for watching, and Black Lives Matter.